This episode is brought to you by the Boot Chow Radio Podcast, Boot Chow 2011 Award. If you haven't listened to the latest episode of the Boot Chow Radio Podcast yet, please click on the link at the video description box below this video. Broadcasting live from Kanagawa, Japan, this is the Platinum Platformer Awards 2011, and here is your host, Getsa. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you everybody, you too. Greetings and welcome to the Platinum Platformer Awards 2011, where I, your host Gexup, is going to present to you the best platformer of 2011, decided by me. But anyway, since a lot of people have been so hyped up and so pumped up for all the platformers being released from January 1st to December 31st, 2011, they all want to know what is, in my personal opinion, the best platformer of 2011. Since there has been a lot of people who've seen the Platinum Platform Awards 2010, they are so desperate to see another one coming to you, which I'm going to present to you. But before we get started, I want to tell everyone who hasn't seen last year's winner of the Platinum Platform Awards was Epic Mickey. But anyway, we're not here to talk about last year's Platinum Platform Awards. We're here to talk about this year's Platinum Platform Awards. And here are your nominees. Little Big Planet. The original has been regarded as one of the best exclusives on the PlayStation 3. It is not only a platformer, but it's also a simulation game where you can be able to build up your own level in any format that you exactly want. But I'm telling you right now, if you love Little Big Planet 1, you're definitely going to love Little Big Planet 2. Alice Madness Returns. Holy crap, I mean, this game is one of the darkest platformers I have ever played. And this game is about how dark and how fucked up the imagination could possibly be to one individual. And for those who don't know, Alice Madness Return is a sequel of the classic America McGee's Alice. And I know that there are a lot of people who consider America McGee's Alice a classic, but let me get my personal feelings out of the way. I hate this game. It has one of the weakest platforming mechanics I have ever seen in my life. The combat is just poor at best. And the checkpoints, holy fucking shit. Is it one of the worst checkpoints I have ever seen? Lord almighty, that game is just fucking brutal. But however, Alice the Madness Returns is actually better than the original. I mean, they got rid of the fucking third person shooting controls and added in a simplistic targeting system that's really reminiscent to Legend of Zelda, the checkpoints is actually superior over the original, but most of all, the platforming is just perfect. You got yourself the most psychotic three platformer ever made. Our next nominee is Super Mario 3D Land. It's been a while since the Mario handheld series has made a game since New Super Mario Bros. But this time, this is the Mario handheld series that is in 3D and it also has 3D effects. If you don't count the Super Mario 64 game on the Nintendo DS, it has a lot of unique features, really fantastic platforming, and most of all, power-ups that isn't heavily limited like Super Mario Galaxy 2. And for those who are asking me why haven't I started this Platinum Platform Awards sooner, it's because I couldn't start start this Platinum Platform Awards without having a Nintendo 3DS. Rayman Origins. I'm going to quote one of my friends who were guests of the Boot Chow 2011 Awards. It basically captures everything that was good from the past Rayman games and put it to one. It has the platforming challenge and the charm from the original. It has the memorable cast from the sequel. And it has the wackiness and fun from the third. And not to mention, they even doubled the gameplay more so than any other game that came out of the franchise. This is one of the best comics that the Rayman series has ever had. And I can't imagine anyone who considered themselves as a Rayman fan to miss out on this game. Our next nominee is, oh god, I know I'm gonna have a lot of heat for this, because I like this, Skylanders Spyro's Adventure. I'm gonna get this out of the way. I love, I love, I like Skylanders Spyro's Adventure. This one is actually tolerable. It feels like the solid platformer that I've been craving for. It has a couple of innovations that sparkles the platformer genre with a bunch of characters that are easily forgettable. It's hard for me to say that I like this game because, you know, deep down inside I hated it. But I have to be honest, 
As much as I have a lot of gripes with this game, I have to admit that the platforming and the gameplay is solid at best. And I know it's really painful to admit this, but I can't deny it. Our next nominee is Mrs. Explosion Man. Just when you thought that the original Explosion Man rocked your world with its crazy attitude and fun platforming gameplay, Miss Explosion Man managed to elevate it to another level. If Pac-Man is equivalent to Miss Pac-Man, then Explosion Man is equivalent to Miss Explosion Man. Those Mrs. series managed to elevate even more than the Mr. series. Kirby's Return to Dreamland. You know, I know that there has been a lot of people that have been complaining that Kirby's Epic Yard wasn't really a Kirby game. But Nintendo managed to listen to its Kirby's fans and managed to give us Kirby Return to Dreamland. But it actually followed everything that we know and love most about the Kirby series. But however, the surprising thing about this game is that they featured co-op. Not only you get a chance to play as Kirby, but you also get a chance to play as Metsonite, King Dedede, and Waddle Dee. With those features alone, they simply entered the Platinum Platform Awards 2011. Our next nominee is Sonic Generation. Sega cleverly made the modern Sonic and the old school model Sonic to have a crossover with one huge adventure. I will have to say that Sega has really delivered. It brings back all the nostalgia that we most remembered from the past Sonic games, from Sonic the Hedgehog 1 to Sonic Adventure 2. And it feels like a breeze to relive these moments with the modern gameplay that I actually liked. Our next nominee is the one franchise that I absolutely love, and that is Ratchet and Clank, all for one. But even though it's not exactly the best Ratchet and Clank game of the series, it is still fun as hell. Insomnia Games cleverly made this game to be one of the best co-op games this generation of video game has offered. This is one of those games that rewards you to having more and more players, maximum four, to play throughout the adventure. And like almost every Ratchet & Clank game ever created, this one was explosive. Our next nominee is one of the most overlooked games of 2011, and that is Outland. Outland was a really, really immersive platformer. Not just any platformer, but it's also a Metroidvania. I couldn't believe the amount of glamorous visuals, solid gameplay, and intense action that you have in this game. Remember how much I praised Limbo last year? Well, if 2010's most creative platformer would have to go to Limbo, my pick for most creative platformer of 2011 would have to go to Outland. And finally, our last nominee is Trine 2. Just like Outland, this game has been overlooked to the public. The first game, Trine, was a puzzle 2D platformer that focused more about the puzzle solving and platforming combined in order to advance to the next level. And in Trine 2, I don't know how else to say it, they managed to make even more pu puzzling challenges than the original. And our final game is Lost in Shadows. It's no surprise that almost everybody forgot about this game, but what really surprised me is that this game feels like it's Ico in Shadow of the Colossus. It just has that artsy style that just shines all over, where your character is a shadow and he can't interact with anything else but the shadows. This game may be very artsy, but does it have what it takes to be one of the best platformers of 2011? Let's find out. Since I talked a lot of positive things about these nominees, oh man, this is not going to be an easy choice because we're going to have to go through the same thing all over again. I'm just going to say screw it. I'm just going to read off the, the winner of the Platinum Platform Awards and it will be over. The winner of the Platinum Platform Awards in 2011 is... Sly 4! Thieves in Time! Thank you ladies and gentlemen. That was a great show and I hope that you enjoyed this Platinum Platform Awards 2011. The end! Nah, nah, nah. I'm just kidding. We're going to have another versus series right here in the Platinum Platform Awards 2011! Just like last year, we're gonna have a total of nine rounds for 12 of these nominees. And for those who've forgotten the rules, here it is. Round one, design. Round two, soundtrack. Round three, platforming. Round four, innovations. Round five, collectibles. Round six, length. Round seven, difficulty. Round eight, creativity. And finally, round nine, my overall pick on my favorite platform of 2011. So what are we waiting for, everybody? Let's start with round one! Round one, design. Now, if you've seen last year's Platinum Platformer Awards, you should already know what to expect. 
This is an elimination competition where we, each and every round, we test each of these platformers and see if they have what I'm looking for in a platformer, whether if it's 2D or 3D. Now, in starting this round, I'm not judging by its graphics. The most important thing about video games is always about designs and gameplay. And judging by its designs, it's all about what specifically am I looking at, what did the designers put in the game to be entertaining to play through, how well made is the presentation, and how well crafted is my path of adventuring is like to fulfill the experience. Now without further ado, let's begin round one. Let's start with Alice Madness Returns. I give so much props for American McGee, the creator of the series, to fix all the issues I had with the first Alice and made it so much better by adding a targeting system to make the combat bearable, the checkpoints are merciful, and everything surrounding you is just artistic. I applaud this game's fantastic level designs from how creepy the enemies are and especially the environments that lets you travel from the beautiful forest to the depressing factories, underwater, a toy world, and even a Japanese version of Wonderland. Exploring Wonderland in this game is so much better than Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland, Disney's Alice in Wonderland, and especially American McGee's Alice. For those who are asking why is this game so creepy and not so uplifting like the Disney movie's incarnation is that Alice in Wonderland first begun as a book and it was not a children's book at all. It was made for adults. Disney made the movie targeted for kids, so the established continuity from the book has been ridiculed. But to see that Madness Returns made the experience more twisted than the book shows how good the game actually is. If there's one thing that I can say about the designs in Alice Madness Returns is that it's beautiful. Unless you're blind, you have to admit that Raymond Origins' designs is artistic. It's all hand-drawn 2D animation using flash animation technology, all done by Michael Ansil and the rest of his development team that put all their drawings and displayed them all in this game. This is a giant homage to the Rayman games, so Ubisoft put so many environments and elements that feels just like the previous games before it. It's quite rare to find games nowadays to find traditional drawings in a game, because in this day and age, people are just looking for eye candy to even consider it a good game. It feels pure and natural to see a game like this to take a step backwards and make it feel like you're playing a cartoon. Throughout your adventure, you'll be seeing a lot of amazing drawings and traces throughout the game. And not to mention, the further you go in your adventure, the more variety you get in your levels, such as open fields, volcanoes, and so on. But most of all, what I love about this game is that there is absolutely no cheap animation. Easily, Raymond Origins was a breeze to play through. Now then, Super Mario 3D Land. I've ranted enough about Super Mario Galaxy 2 being the exact same game as the first Mario Galaxy, but here, it doesn't look or feel any different than the previous Galaxy games, except now your objective of the game is to get to the top of the flag, just like the original Super Mario Brothers, and the power-ups offered here are not limited from a time limit. These power-ups significantly enhances the gameplay like the long-awaited Raccoon Suit, Super Leaf, Boomerang Flower, the Propeller Box, and more. Everything else is what you expected from the previous Mario games from Mario Galaxy 1. It has unique level designs that follows the Mario formula, and that's all I can say. Since Sonic Generation's whole purpose is to celebrate the franchise's 20th anniversary, Sega decided to go back through the historic levels from the previous Sonic games and made them all into a 3D platformer. So it is expected to relive the Green Hill Zone level all the way to the city levels from Sonic Adventure 2. And you know what? They were great back then, and they are still today. So if you want to relive these moments, but with the modern Sonic gameplay, this game is for you. And for Miss Splosion Man, it's everything that you know from the original Splosion Man, but with that poppy feel that you get throughout the game that seems to appeal to the female audience and made it twice as explosive, no pun intended. It has numerous factory levels and a futuristic setting. Nothing more I can add, except for the fact that I love to make so much destruction throughout the game, from crashing through windows, to jump into bombs to get to a higher distance platform. And now with Little Big Planet 2, you got yourself a lot of good physics and solid designs that made customizing your own levels to feel great as the regular levels. Just like the original, what the designs that Little Big Planet 2 was going for was to have a toy-like world that looks like it was built from a child. This game instantly brings a lot of charm whenever you play in the game, whether it's from the hard copy of the game or it's a customized level created by another player who posted it online. And like Little Big Planet, Little Big Planet 2's designs are still great. 
Shrine 2's design is all about traveling in a fantasy-like medieval world filled with monsters, sorcerers, and so on that suits the theme that the game is going for. It's really reminiscent to a classic called Magician Ward for the Neo Geo, but most of all, since this is a puzzle platformer, it has so many obstacles that it's not just diving in and platform, but instead, they have platforming segments that make you stop and think. You have three characters, one knight, one archer, and the other a wizard, and they all have their own abilities that can be solved for certain characters. The knight can easily destroy his enemies faster, the archer can use her arrows to shoot and activate long distant areas that no one can literally reach, and she has the ability to summon a rope just to swing through areas. And for the wizard, he can do so many things such as lifting an object with his magic spell, and new to the series is summoning boxes to act as platforms to reach to areas that no other character could. Switching to any one of these three characters is mandatory if you want to be trying to. The designs and the atmosphere in this game feel so magical that it feels like it belongs in an RPG. And if you love that feeling that you get in role-playing games, this platformer is highly recommendable for you. And now for Kirby's Return to Dreamland. It's another game that follows its established continuity, so everything that you know from the series is expected here. Nintendo added co-op to the series, where you have King DDD, Meta Knight, and Waddle Dee traveling from point A to B in each and every level together. However, my biggest issue with the feel that you get when playing this game is that it feels like Super Smash Bros. Brawl's Adventure Mode, the Subspace Emissary. The controls, the motion, the moves, the challenge, it all feels the same, but less like a fighter, and more like a traditional Kirby game. I know that this game was developed by the same guys who made the Smash Bros. games, but it annoys me that you paid full price for a game that almost feels like another that has already been released. But that's not my least favorite designs in this competition. And now we have Ratchet & Clank for one. I know I'm a huge fan of this series and it's expected for me to praise this game for its co-op feature, but I'm here to talk about the designs. The environments feel like the Ratchet & Clank Future series, where it all feels lively, futuristic, and you end up to places that are out of the ordinary. Since this is co-op, I applaud to Insomnia Games for making this game on rails, with fixed camera, and abandoned the decision of making split screen. Just imagine just waiting for someone to catch up every time you're in an obstacle or a puzzle that requires more than one player to solve. Off. It would have been unbearable, but at least with the fixed camera, it made all players playing the game to stick together all the way. It's great and all, but my biggest issue is that this game has the worst character designs from the series. I mean, Ratchet and Clank's heads are just way too big and way off compared to the previous before it. I know Clank never held any of Ratchet's weapons and they need to make him bigger in order to have the same moves and to use the same weapons, but honestly, it looked like something that high impact games would fucked up. Not Insomniac. I mean, just imagine if you played each of these games chronologically blindly. Could you imagine yourself shocked at the decisions made it for our character's design? Say all you want that I'm nitpicky. I can't overlook this flaw I have with the game. It feels really out of place. But however, it's not the worst designs offered in this Platinum Platform Awards. For Skylander Spyro's Adventure, I will have to say that the character designs are actually worse than all for one. I mean, there isn't really a single player that looks appealing. They just look way too cartoony and way out of place, but I can't argue that the level designs are decent enough for a platformer like this. You have floating islands, you have a medieval fantasy-like world, and you also have the expected variety of places you want to go, such as volcanoes and so on. Since this game has multiple characters other than Spyro, this game encouraged players to use its innovative, yet gimmicky toy models in the machine that came with the game in order to enter the character. It's a total gimmick to do this, since you already have the ability to choose characters without them. Since I've started from being positive to negative in this round, let me go back and being positive and telling you what is, in my personal opinion, the best design platformer of 2011, and that is Outland. How could this game not be one of the best looking platformers that has been released in 2011? This game took the creative mythos from the South American and Asian legends and myths and put them into one huge adventure. It's a Metroidvania game where you have a non-linear world with so many places to go that can only be reached by the required power-ups. You got areas to go like the scattered jungle, the underworld, snowy mountains, and so much more. What I admire most about the designs is that the characters are pitch black, but the characters and objects that glow various colors to indicate what the player has to face. This is 
one of those games where it takes the use of collar in its full potential. There are two different collars you have to end up, and everything that you have to face is an obstacle, red and blue. These two collars serves yin and yang, and any one of these collars can easily hurt you unless you switch that collar to red or blue. It becomes mandatory if you want to survive, so if you see spores or blue beams remaining in the collar of red, you will get hurt if you were in the collar of blue or not in the collar of red. However, when you switch to red, any deadly object that's in the same color as red, you immune to no damage. However, if there are any deadly objects that's in the color blue, remaining in the color red will get you hurt, but switching to the color of blue, you immune to no damage. With this formula, you have so many opportunities for a whole new level of platforming challenge and a brand new experience of how to survive incoming obstacles. However, enemies can hurt you no matter what color you are, but you can't hurt them unless you're the opposite color. The same goes to the switches and platformers that disappears when you're not in the right color. Throughout the experience, Ubisoft used so many new ideas of using this formula at its full potential and new ways of a challenge and adventure. To say that this is one of the best looking platformers that came out in 2011 is an understatement. This is perhaps the most artistic platformer I have ever seen in my life. It's up there with the Odd World games, and I don't think that there was ever a game in existence that ever made changing colors so interactive in all my years in gaming. And now it's time for me to pick the loser of this round, and my pick goes to Lost in Shadows. I admit that this game is creative, that it took the turn playing with your shadow to be in a full game. You play as a character who's been cursed into a shadow and must solve many puzzles by making objects from the physical world to move so that the object's shadow can move, and use such light to move the shadows. At its best, it feels like Ico and Shadow the Colossus. However, I can't believe such visuals is literally painful to watch. Okay, you might be thinking that I'm sounding like a graphics whore, but hear me out. The lighting effects and looking at your shadows hours upon hours really hurt your eyes. A friend of mine gave me this game and he said he couldn't play such a game because it hurt his eyes. And after playing it, I can see why. Just when you thought struggling to center your eyes to get the 3D effects from the Nintendo 3DS was hard, here it's literally all you get from the game, nothing else. Say what you will about how ugly Spyro and Ratchet and Clank's new character designs are, but at least they don't cause eye strains like this game does. Not to mention that the hit detection is mediocre and the variety in your adventure is lacking, which shows this is why this game's interesting ideas only sound good on paper. So the one eliminated? Lost in Shadows. Round 2, Soundtrack. You know, platformers are always most known for having some of the catchiest tunes ever provided. Their unique soundtrack and memorable score from each and every one of these games creates a lasting appeal. So in this round, I'll be judging each of these nominees on how unique the soundtrack is and how memorable the score is. So let's look at them, shall we? Beginning with Little Big Planet 2, I have to admit that it wasn't as charming or unique as the first game, but still charming to listen to. Since this game is going for that toy-like world, it's most expected to have great variety of experimental music. It's really charming that this platformer goes for the experimental score, is because for a game that has customization, it needs to have a really unique blend of creative music in order for those who are creating levels to feel creative, just like the Sims series. I'm not counting those customized levels that are online. Line. I am of course talking about what is in the copy of the game itself. The soundtrack here just doesn't feel as big or get you in the mood to adventure like the original did, but it's still tolerable. Super Mario 3D Land soundtrack isn't totally new. It takes the memorable soundtracks from the past Mario games and remixes them like the Galaxy series. But for the new soundtracks offered in this title, it's all about upbeat, joyful music to make it feel like a breeze to play. But since this Mario game soundtrack uses horns and saxophone and other aerophone instruments, most of the time it started sounding like a corny 80s themed TV show, similar to Cisco and Ebert. You know, it feels kind of out of place for levels such as these to listen to, unlike the Galaxy games where they made it feel magical and epic like going to Disneyland. I really can't say the soundtrack sticks out like a sore thumb, it just feels so corny. Speaking of corny, since Miss Plosion Man's purpose is to be the platformer for the female audience, the creators of the game took a clever decision to put pop music in their score. It doesn't appeal to me, but to be honest, it might appeal to the female audience. I tested it out with my girlfriend, and she thought it was cool, and but got mad at me when I said it wasn't that great. So for the sake of my relationship with her, I'm keeping this game from being eliminated. Now even getting better, trying to use Soundtrack's great score 
totally fits the theme of fantasy adventure. It has that magical feel that feels like it came out of a role-playing game, and for a game about knights, wizards, and monsters, it shouldn't be a surprise that it's here. But really, it gets better and better when you continue the game just listening to the wonderful score. The best way I can describe the soundtrack of the Ratchet & Clank series is that it combines theatrical score with electronic music. It fits the series quite well since it's set in the Galactic Conquest. It's no exception for All for One, and usually the music is just there, nothing really incredible like the past Ratchet & Clank soundtracks, but at times when there's no action going on, like shopping for weapons in the Gadgetron vendor, it becomes more than just noticeable. You can just instantly feel its beauty. The Kirby series soundtrack has always been known for its magical and uplifting score that puts you in a good mood once listening to it. One way that I can describe this wonderful score is that it is adorable and magical that even thinking about putting down this game could make you feel sad inside. I don't know, it seems like this is what Super Mario 3D Land is lacking, that Kirby's Return to Dream Land did better. The best soundtrack is the one that you're listening to right now, Cookie Country. So why is this track not the opening theme song? I don't really know. Now, getting to the total opposite of cute soundtrack, let's jump to Alice Madness Returns. Like the first game, America McGee's decision to make the move throughout Alice Madness Returns to feel dark and optimistic. And with that direction, you need a really dark soundtrack going on. And I'm surprised that most of these tracks in the soundtrack is actually magical and at times catchy. The score feels like it belongs in the soap opera or theatrical play, and it's nothing that you can expect in a 3D platformer like this, except probably if you go to a horror level or something like that. With this really creepy and disturbing music playing around, Around, it just makes the world of Wonderland so mysterious in a way. And the track you're listening to right now is actually the best track in the whole game where you feel like you want to kill someone. Scary thought, isn't it? Now for Sonic Generations. To celebrate the franchise's 20th anniversary, you have to relive those old tracks from the old games, and that's what Sega delivered. It kept in all the rock tracks from the Sonic Adventure series, and it was expected to see that old tracks from the Genesis era to be remixed, like how Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1 did. But I will say that many of the tracks were in electronic, like the Rooftop Run, where they made that track mixed with rock music that has a violin that replaced a guitar. Now that's something unique. Now in Outland, you got yourself one of the most epic soundtracks offered in platformers of 2011. It feels very mysterious, atmospheric, and magical all at once, which perfectly fits the theme of South American and Asian fantasy. It reminds me a lot of the Aztec level from Bugs and Taz Time Busters. The score is just simply beautiful and spiritual in the sort of way. But when it comes to score for the boss fights, it feels extremely epic. It feels as if the gods appears out of the face of the earth just to display their wrath upon thee. And considering that this game has some of the best boss fights in 2011, it suits very well for a soundtrack like this. If there's one thing I can say about Atlant score, it's effective. But hands down, the best soundtrack that came out from platformers of 2011 is Rayman Origins. It's all original, and it doesn't stick with one music genre throughout the game. They don't take the soundtrack from the previous games of the franchise, unlike so many other sequels that tries to suck up the nostalgia factor, but this one here takes original tunes and makes such original experimentations with it. It's a great combination of ska and world music made the soundtrack feel brilliant while listening to the tracks. Since this game is going for the cartoony direction, an uplifting soundtrack like this suits very well for the game like this. You can easily identify instruments that is playing, but this game does it so well that made it so memorable. Heck, even when the lungs are singing, it still sticks to your head. And now, this is the part where I pick the loser of this round. And my pick goes to Skylanders, Spyro's Adventure. I honestly can't say that there was a single memorable track in this game. It's sad to say that even the Spyro games that I hate with a great passion has even more memorable music than this game. Why not getting Stuart Copeland to return making such memorable music from the PS1 days since Sting and Police are not doing anything nowadays? Now, I know that there are some that are saying that I'm not being fair since I'm not judging this game for its own merits. Okay, so this game's soundtrack is similar to Thrine 2, where Thrine 2 had an epic score, and this is what Activision has to offer. Okay, so the soundtrack isn't the only main problem of the game. The biggest issue is the price and how much all that money costs, and yet it doesn't really do anything spectacular or anything relatively new to the platform genre. As much as I 
like this game, even if it lasts this round, it can't last any longer with these upcoming challenges in this competition. The platforming challenge isn't challenging, the difficulty is basic, and the creativity isn't anything new except for the toys. So the loser is Skylanders Spyro's Adventure.